This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. And Cash App will also donate $10 to FIRST, an organization that is helping to advance robotics and STEM education for young people around the world. And now, here's my conversation with Dmitry Dolgov. When did you first fall in love with robotics or even computer science more in general? Computer science first at a fairly young age. The robotics happened much later. Um, I, uh, I think my first interesting introduction to computers was in the late eighties, uh, when we got our first computer, I think it was an, uh, an IBM, I think IBM AT. I think, do you remember those things that had like a turbo button in the front? Turbo that, button, right? Yeah, you would uh, press it and uh, you know uh, make make the thing goes faster. Did they already have floppy disks? Yeah, 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 yeah. The, like the the five point four inch ones. I think there was a bigger inch. So go one something, then five inches, then three inches. Yeah, I think that was the five. I don't. I maybe that was before that was the, the giant plates. Then I didn't get that. Uh, but it was definitely not the not the three inch ones. Uh, anyway, so that that you know we got that uh, computer. I spent the first uh, few months just you know playing video games, uh, as you would expect. I uh, got bored of that, uh, so I uh, started messing around and uh, trying to figure out how to you know make the thing do other stuff got into uh exploring you know programming and a couple of years later it got to a point where um i actually wrote a game. it's a big uh, deal it's a big deal yeah uh, i did not take the deal wow integrity yeah uh, i i instead i uh, stupidity yes that was not the most acute financial move that I made in my life, you know, looking back at it now, uh, I, I instead put it, well, you know, I, I had a reason I, I put it on. <laughs> well, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if the match closed. <laughs> case closed. I don't, yeah, but that that's more about games that. There's a story. It's like an interactive version of an Elder Scrolls Tolkien world, and you get to live in it. I don't know. I miss it. It's one of the things that suck about being an adult is there's no, you, you have to live in the real world as opposed to the Elder Scrolls world. You know, whatever brings you joy, right? What's Minecraft, that? right? Minecraft is a great example. You create, like it's not the fancy graphics, but it's the creation of your own worlds. Yeah, that one is crazy. You know, one of the pitches for being a parent that people tell me is that you can like use the excuse of parenting to to go back into the video game world, and like, like that's like, you know, father son father father daughter time, but really you just get to play video games with your kids. So anyway, at that time, did you have any ridiculous ambitious dreams of where as a creator you might go? As an engineer, did you what, what did you think of yourself as as an engineer, as a tinker, or did you want to be like an astronaut or something like that? You're familiar with that, Lex? They had these, uh, you know, police officers that would stand in the middle of an intersection all day, and they would have their like striped back, black and white batons that they would use to you know control the flow of traffic, and you know for whatever reasons, I was strangely infatuated with this whole process and like that that was my dream uh that's what i wanted to do when i grew up and you know my parents uh both physics profs by the way i think were you know a little concerned uh with that level of ambition coming from their child yeah. uh at you know that age well that it's an interesting i don't know if you can relate but i very much love that idea i have a ocd nature that i think lends itself very close to the engineering mindset 
which is you want to kind of optimize, you know, solve a problem by create, creating an automated solution, like a, like a, a set of rules, a set of rules you can follow, and then thereby make it ultra efficient. I don't know if that's, it was of that nature. I, I certainly have that. There's like fact, like SimCity and factory building games, all those kinds of things. The school that I really got involved in robotics, which was actually self-driving cars. And, you know, that was a big bit flip. What, I, uh, what grad school? So I went to grad school in Michigan, and then I did a postdoc at Stanford, uh, which is, that was the postdoc where I got to play with self-driving cars. Yeah, so we'll return there. But let's go back to uh, to Moscow. So, I, I, you know, for episode 100, I talked to my dad. And also, I grew up with my dad, I guess. <laughs> uh, so I, I had to put up with him for many years. And uh, he he went to the Fistiach, or MIPT. It's weird to say in English, because I've heard all of this in Russian. Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. And to me, that was like, I met some super interesting, as a child, I met some super interesting characters. It felt to me like the greatest university in the world, the most elite university in the world. And just the, the people that I met that came out of there were like, not only brilliant, but also special humans. It seems like that place really tested the soul, <laughs> uh, both like in terms of technically and like spiritually. So that could be just the rom romanticization of that place. I'm not sure, but so maybe you can speak to it. But did, is it correct to say that you spent some time at Fistiach? Yeah, that's right. Six years. Uh, I got my bachelor's and master's in uh, physics and math there. And it's actually interesting because my my. <laughs> of you know math uh, and physics and uh, you know lots of good memories uh, from yeah from those times so okay so stanford how'd you get into autonomous vehicles i had the great fortune uh, and great honor to join stanford's darpa urban challenge team in uh, 2006 there this was a third in the sequence of the darpa challenges there were two grand challenges Prior to that, and then in 2007, they held the DARPA Urban Challenge. So, you know, I was doing my postdoc. I had I joined the team and uh, worked on motion planning uh, for you know, that that competition. So, okay, so for people who might not know, I know from from a certain <laughs> autonomous vehicles is a funny world. In a certain circle of people, everybody knows everything, and in a certain circle. Uh, the, nobody knows anything in, in terms of general public. So it's interesting. It's it's a good question what to talk about, but I do think that the Urban Challenge is worth revisiting. It's a fun little challenge, one that first of all, like sparked so much, so many incredible minds to focus on a, one of the hardest problems of our time in artificial intelligence. So that's it's a success from a perspective of a single little challenge. But can you talk about like, what did the challenge involve? So were there pedestrians? Were there other cars? What was the goal? Uh, who was on the team? How long did it take? Like any fun, fun. Or dynamic environments and you know, share them with other vehicles. There were no pedestrians uh, there, but what DARPA did is they took over an abandoned Air Force Base, uh, and it was kind of like a little fake city uh, that they built out there. And they had a bunch of uh, robots, uh, you know, cars uh, that were autonomous uh, in there all at the same time, uh, mixed in with other vehicles driven by professional uh, drivers. And each car uh, had a mission. Right, and so there's a crude uh, map that they received uh, at the beginning, and they had a mission you know, go you know here and then there and over here, um, and they kind of all were sharing this environment at the same time. They had to interact to interact with each other. They had to interact with the human drivers. So it's this very first, very rudimentary um, version of uh, a self-driving car that you know could operate on and on 
uh, in, a, in an environment you know, shared with other dynamic actors that, as you said, you know, really, you know, in many ways, you know, kickstarted this whole industry. Okay, so who was on the team and how'd you do? I forget. <laughs> uh, came in second. Uh, perhaps that was my contribution to the team. I think the Stanford team <laughs> came in first in the DARPA challenge, uh, but then I joined the team and, you know, we you were the one with the bug I, I, in the I, code. I mean, do you have sort of memories of some particularly challenging things or, you know, one of the cool things, it's not a you know, this isn't a product, this isn't the thing that, uh, you know, it, there's, you have a little bit more freedom to experiment so you can take risks and there's, uh, so you can make mistakes. Uh, so is there interesting mistakes? Is there interesting challenges that stand out to you or some like taught you, uh, a, a good technical lesson or a good philosophical lesson from that time? Yeah, uh, you know, definitely, definitely a very memorable time. Not really a challenge, but like a, one of the most vivid memories that I have from the time. And I think that was actually one of the days that you know really got me hooked uh, on this whole field was uh, the first time I got to run my software on the car. And uh, I was working on a part of our planning algorithm uh, that had to navigate in parking lots. So it was you know, something that you know, called free space uh, motion planning. So the very first version of that, uh, was, you know, we tried on the car. It was on Stanford's campus uh, in the middle of the night and you know, had this little you know, course constructed with cones uh, in the middle of a parking lot. So we we're there at like 3 a.m. You know, by the time we got the code to, you know, uh, uh, you know, compile and turn over. Uh, and, you know, for, you know, the rest of the night, uh, just my mind was blown. <laughs> just like, and you know, that, that, that's what I've been, you know, doing ever since for you know, more than a decade. Uh, in terms of challenges and uh, you know, it's interesting memories. Like on the day of the competition, uh, it was you know, pretty nerve wracking. Uh, I remember you know, standing there with Mike Montemarillo, who was uh, the software lead and wrote most of the code. I think I did one little part of the planner. Mike, you know, incredibly did you know, pretty much the rest of it uh, with, with with you know a bunch of other incredible people. But I remember standing on the day of the competition, uh, you know, watching the car, you know, with Mike, and you know, cars are. Uh, completely empty, right? They're all there lined up in the beginning of the race. And then, you know, DARPA sends them, you know, uh, on their mission one by one. So then leave and like, you just, you know, they had these sirens, well, 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 they all had their different silence, silence, right? Each siren had its own personality, if you will. So, you know, off they go and you don't see them. You just kind of, and then every once in a while, they, you know, come a little bit closer to where uh, you know, the audience is and you can kind of hear you know, the sound of your car and, you know, it seems to be moving along so that, you know, it gives you hope. And then, you know, it goes away and you can't hear it for too long. You start getting anxious, right? So it's a little bit like, you know, sending your kids to college and like, you know, kind of you invested in them. You hope you, 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 you build it properly, but like it's, it's still uh, anxiety inducing. Uh, so that was uh, an incredibly uh, fun uh, few days. In terms of, you know, bugs, as you mentioned, you know, one, that, that was my bug that caused us the loss of the first place mm -hmm. uh, is there still uh, a debate that you know, occasionally have with people on the CMU team. CMU came first, <laughs> I, sh I should mention uh, that. CMU uh, haven't heard of them, but yeah, uh, it's some you know <laughs> it's little, a small little school. school it's 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 yeah, it's a really a glitch that you know they happen to succeed at something robotics related. Very scenic though, so you <laughs> most people go there for the scenery. Um, yeah. That's right. It's a beautiful campus. <laughs> <laughs> I unlike, apologize. Unlike, unlike Stanford. So uh, for, for people, yeah, yeah, that's true. Unlike Stanford. For people who don't know, CMU is one of the great robotics and sort of artificial intelligence universities in the world. CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. Okay, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> good, good PSA. So in the part that I contributed to, which was navigating parking lots and the way, you know, that part of the mission worked is... Yeah, you in a parking lot, you would get from DARPA an outline of the map. You basically get this, you know, giant polygon that defined the perimeter of the parking lot. Uh, and there would be an entrance and, you know, so maybe you know, multiple entrances or access to it. And then you would get a goal uh, within that open space, uh, X, Y, you know, heading where the car had to park. It had no information about the obstacles, so any obstacles that the car might encounter there. So it had to navigate. 
different way that cost you some time. And right? so there's still a debate whether, you know, it was my poor implementation that cost us extra time or whether it was, you know, CMU uh, violating an important the rule of the competition. And, you know, I have my own uh, uh, opinion here. In terms of other bugs, and like, uh, I, I have to apologize to Mike Montemerla uh, you know, for sharing this on air, <laughs> but it is actually uh, one of the more memorable ones. Uh, and it's something that's kind of become a bit of a, a metaphor and a label in the industry uh, since then, I think, you know, at least in some circles, it's called the victory circle or victory lap. Um, and uh, it, uh, our cars did that. So in one of the missions in the urban challenge, in, in one of the courses, uh, there was this big oval right by the start and finish of the race. So the ARPA had a lot of the missions would finish kind of in that same location. Uh, and it was pretty cool because you, you could see the cars come by, you know, kind of finish that part leg of the trip, the, that leg of the mission, and then, you know, go on and, you know, finish the rest of it. Uh, and other vehicles would, you know, come hit their waypoint uh, and, you know, exit the oval and uh, off they would go. Yeah. Our car in the hand would hit the checkpoint and then it would do an extra lap around the oval and only then, you know, uh, leave and go on its merry way. So over the course of, you know, the full day, it accumulated uh, uh, some extra time. And the problem was that we had a bug where it wouldn't, you know, start reasoning about the next waypoint and plan a route to get to that next point until it hit a previous one. And in that particular case, by the time you hit the that, that one, it was too late for us to consider consider the next one and kind of make a lane change so that every time it would do like an extra lap. So and it you know, became known as the the Stanford victory lap. <laughs> the victory lap. Oh, there's, there's, I feel like there's something philosophically profound in there somehow. But uh, I mean, ultimately, everybody is a winner in that kind of competition. And it, it led to sort of famously to the creation of... Um, Google self-driving car project and now Waymo. So can we uh, give an overview of how was Waymo born? How is the Google self-driving car project born? What is, the, what is the mission? What is the hope? What is it is the engineering kind of uh, set of milestones that it seeks to accomplish? There's a lot of questions in there. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't but know. you're right. It, it, it kind of the DARPA Urban Challenge and the DARPA, you know, previous DARPA Grand Challenges uh, kind of led, I think, to a very large you know, degree to that next step. And then, you know, Larry and Sergey, um, uh, Larry Page and you know, Sergey Brin, uh, uh, Google Hunter scored, you know, uh, saw that competition and you know, believed in the technology. So, you know, the Google self-driving car project was born. <laughs> maximized learnings if you will the, the two milestones were you know uh, one was to drive a hundred thousand miles in autonomous mode which was at that time you know orders of magnitude that you know, uh, more than anybody has ever done and the second milestone was to drive 10 routes uh each one was a hundred miles long they were specifically chosen to be kind of extra spicy, you know, extra complicated, and sample the full complexity right. of the that that uh, domain. Um, uh, and you had to drive each one from beginning to end with no intervention, no human intervention. So you would get to the beginning of the course, uh, you would you know, press the the button that would engage in autonomy, and you had to you know go. F for 100 miles, you know, beginning to end uh, with no interventions. Um, you were, you know, this is when you're kind of, you know, working 24 seven and you're know, hacking things together. And you also don't know how hard this is. I mean, that's the point. Like, so, I mean, that's an ambitious, if I put myself in that mindset, even still, that's a really ambitious set of goals. Like just those two, just picking, just picking ten different difficult, spicy challenges, and then having zero interventions. So like not saying gradually we're going to, like, you know, over a period of ten years we're going to have a bunch of routes and gradually reduce the number of interventions. <laughs> Whether that takes two years or whether that takes twenty years, I mean, it took maybe. us under two. I guess that that speaks to a, a really big 
difference between doing something once and having a prototype yeah. uh, where you are going after you know learning about the problem versus how you go about engineering a product that you know, where you, you know, look at uh, you know you do properly do evaluation you look at metrics you you know drive down and you're confident that you can do that at home. and I guess that's the you know why it took uh, a dozen people uh you know 16 months or a little bit more than that uh back in 2009 and 2010 you know, with the technology of you know the more than a decade ago uh that amount of time to achieve that milestone of you know, 10 routes uh 100 miles each and no interventions memories of uh technical lessons or just one like what did you learn about the problem of driving from that experience i mean we could we can now talk about like what you learned from modern day waymo but i feel like you may have learned some profound things in those early days even more so because it feels like what waymo is now is to trying to you know how to do scale how to make sure you create a product how to make sure it's like safety and you know, all those things which is all fascinating challenges but like you were facing the more fundamental philosophical problem of driving in those early days. Like what the hell is driving as an autonomous, or maybe I'm again, romanticizing it, but is, <laughs> is, there, uh, is there some valuable lessons you picked up over there at, the, at those two years? Uh, a ton. The most important one is probably that we believe that it's doable and we we've yeah. gotten uh, you know, far enough into the problem that uh you know we, we had a i think only a glimpse of the true complexity uh of the the that the domain you know it's a little bit like you know climbing a mountain where you kind of you know see the next peak and you think that's kind of the summit but then you get to that and you kind of see that that this is just the, the start of the journey uh, but we've tried we've sampled enough of the problem space and we've made enough rapid uh success even you know with technology of 2009 2010 that uh it gave us confidence to then you know pursue this uh, as a real product so okay so the next step you mentioned the the milestones that you had in the in, the, in those two years what are the next milestones that then led to the creation of waymo and beyond yeah we had a uh, it was a really interesting journey and you know waymo came a little bit later uh then you know the, we completed those milestones in 2010 uh, that was the pivot when we decided to focus on actually building a product you know using this technology uh the initial couple of years after that we were focused on a freeway you know what you would call a driver assist uh maybe you know an l3 uh, driver assist uh program then around 2013 we've learned enough uh about the space and have thought you know more deeply about you know the product that we wanted to build that we pivoted uh, we pivoted towards uh, this vision of you know building a driver uh, and deploying it fully driverless vehicles without a person and that that's the path that we've been on since then and uh, very it was exactly the right decision for us so there was a moment where you also considered like what is the right trajectory here what is the right role of automation in the in the task of driving there is still it, it wasn't from the early days obvious that you want to go fully autonomous from the early days it was not i think it was in 20 around 2013. a huge step for us really big milestone where we started i think it was october of 2017 where when we uh started regular uh driverless operations on public roads uh, that first day of operations we drove uh in one day and that first day 100 miles in you know driverless fashion and then we've you know, the most the most important thing about that milestone was not that you know 100 miles in one day but that it was the start of kind of regular ongoing driverless operations and when you say driverless it means no driver that's exactly right so on that first day we actually had a mix and up uh, in some uh 
we didn't want to like you know be on YouTube and Twitter that same day. So in uh, in, in many of the rides, we had somebody in the driver's seat, yeah. but they could not disengage. Like the car I got not disengage. So this uh, is but in, in actually on that first day, uh, some of the miles were driven in just completely uh, empty, empty driver's seat. I mean, this is the key distinction that I think people don't realize is, you know, that oftentimes when you talk about autonomous vehicles, you're, there's often a driver in the seat that's ready to, um, to take over uh, what, what's called a safety driver. And then Waymo is really one of the only companies, at least that I'm aware of, or at least as like boldly and carefully and all and all that is actually has cases and now we'll talk about more and more where there's literally no driver so the, that's another the, in the interesting case of where the driver is not supposed to disengage that's like a nice middle ground they're still there but they're not supposed to disengage but really there's the case when there's no okay there's something magical about there being nobody in the driver's seat like, just like to me, you mentioned um, the first. Like, make a left turn, like, apply sufficient torque to the steering wheel to where, it, like, there's a lot of rotation. And for some reason, and there's nobody in the driver's seat, for some reason that that communicates that here's a being with power that makes a decision. There's something about like the steering wheel, because we, we perhaps romanticize the notion of the steering wheel. It's so essential to the, our conception, our 20th century conception of a car. And it turning the steering wheel with nobody in the driver's seat, that to me, I think maybe to others, it's really powerful. Like this thing is in control. And then there's this leap of trust that you give, like I'm gonna put my life in the hands of this thing that's in control. So in that sense, when there's no but no driver in the driver's seat, that's a magical moment for robots. So I I'm uh, I got a chance to uh, last year to take a ride in uh, in a Waymo vehicle, and that that was the magical moment. There's like nobody in the driver's seat. It, it's it's like the little details. You would think it doesn't matter whether there's a driver or not, but like if if there's no driver and the steering wheel is turning on its own. I don't know. That's magical. It's, it's absolutely magical. I, I, I've taken many of these rides in a completely empty car. Body uh, in the car, but you, right? That's something called you know, fully driverless, you know, our uh, rider only uh, mode of operation. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is magical it is you know uh, transformative this is what we hear from our uh writers it kind of really changes your experience and not like that that really is what unlocks the real potential of this technology uh but you know coming back to our journey uh you know that was 2017 when we started uh you know, truly driverless operations and then in 2018 we've uh launched our uh public a round of external financing uh this year you know we're part of alphabet so obviously we have access to you know significant resources but as kind of on the journey of way more maturing as a company it made sense for us to you know partially go externally uh uh and in, in this round so you know we're raised uh, about 3.2 billion dollars uh with from you know that round uh we've also you know uh, started putting our fifth generation of our driver, our hardware uh, uh, that is on the new vehicle, but it's also a qualitatively different set of uh, self-driving hardware uh, that, self uh, that uh, is now on the JLR pace. So that was a very important step for us. The hardware specs, fifth generation, I think it would be fun to maybe... Uh, <laughs> Uh, as with previous generations, in terms of sensing, we have lidars, cameras, and radars, and we have a 
a pretty beefy computer that processes all that information and makes you know decisions in real time on on board the car. Uh, so in all of the and it, it's really a qualitative uh, jump forward in terms of the capabilities and you know, the various parameters and the specs of the hardware compared to what we had before and you know, compared to what you can kind of get off the off the shelf in the market today. Meaning uh, from fifth to fourth or from fifth to first. Definitely from uh, first to fifth, but also from the, that was fourth, the from, world's uh, dumbest uh, question. De- okay. Definitely, <laughs> no, uh, definitely from fourth to fifth. Okay, uh, gotcha. as well as uh, right. uh, this, that last step is a, is a big step forward. So everything's in house. So the, like lidar is built in house, and right. and cameras are built in house. Just basic computers. You have to uh, probably do a lot of signal processing on all the different sensors. You have to integrate everything has to be in real time. There's probably some kind of redundancy type of situation. Is there something interesting you could say about the computer for the people who love hardware? It does have all of the characteristics, all the properties that you just mentioned. Uh, Redundancy, uh, very beefy compute. Uh, for general processing as well as you know inference and ML models, it is some of the more sensitive stuff that you know I don't want to get into for IP reasons. But yeah, you, know, you can we've shared a little bit uh, in terms of the specs of the sensors uh, that we have on the car. You know, we actually shared you know, some videos of uh, what our lighter sees uh lighters see in the world mm-hmm. uh, we have 29 cameras we have you know, five lighters we have six radars uh, on these vehicles and you can kind of get a feel for the amount of data that they're producing that all has to be pro- uh, hardware that, that optimizes for machine learning is there something you can reveal in terms of how much you mentioned customization, how much customization there is for hardware for machine learning purposes. I'm going to be like that government, you know, you like a uh, <laughs> we, I, person in body of foes. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I, I guess I, you know, will say that it, it, it's, it's really compute is really important. Uh, we have very data hungry and compute hungry ML models kind of all over uh, our stack. And this is where, you know, both being you know, part of Alphabet as well as designing our own sensors and the entire hardware suite together, where on you know one hand you get access to like really rich uh, raw sensor data that you can pipe from your sensors uh, 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 into your compute platform yeah, and build like build the whole pipe you know, from sensor raw sensor data to the big compute as then have the massive compute to process all that data. Uh, this is where we're finding that uh, having a lot of control of that that hardware part of the stack is really advantageous. One of the fascinating magical places to me, again, might not be able to speak to the details, but is the it is the other compute, which is like, you know, this we're just talking about a single car, but the, you know, the driving experience is a source of a lot of fascinating data. And you have a huge amount of data coming in on the car, on the car, and you know the infrastructure of storing some of that data to then train or, or to analyze or so on. That's a- and the information that they exchange with each other uh, in real time. Uh, to you know, make you know better decisions, as well uh, as on the kind of the offboard component, where you have to deal with massive amounts of data for you know, training your ML models, evaluating the ML models, uh, for you know simulating the entire system, and for you know evaluating your entire system. And this is where you know, being part of uh, Alphabet has been, once again been tremendously uh advantageous we consume an incredible amount of you know compute for ml infrastructure uh we build a lot of custom frameworks to you know get good at you know uh you know, on data mining uh finding the interesting edge cases for training and for evaluation of the system uh for uh both training and evaluating sub components and you know sub uh parts of the system on various ml models as well as the uh evaluating the entire system and simulation 
Okay, is that first piece that you mentioned no. that ca cars communicating to each other essentially, I mean, through perhaps through a centralized point, but what, uh, that's fascinating too. How much does that help you? Like if you imagine, like, you know, right now the number of way more vehicles is whatever X, I don't know if you can talk to what that number is, but it's, it's not in the hundreds of millions yet. And <laughs> imagine if the whole world is way more vehicles. Uh, like that changes potentially the power of connectivity. Like the more cars you have, I guess actually, if you look at Phoenix, because there's enough vehicles, uh, there's enough, when there's a, like some level of density, you can start to probably do some really interesting stuff with the fact that cars can negotiate, can be, uh, can communicate with each other and thereby make decisions. Is there something interesting there? that you can talk to about like, how does that help with the driving problem from as compared to just a single car solving the driving problem by itself? Uh, yeah. You have a fully uh, autonomous, you know, fully capable uh, driver uh that you know computerized driver that each car has uh then you know they do share information uh and they share information in real time it really really helps all right so the way we uh do this today is uh you know whenever one car uh encounters something interesting in the world whether it you know, might be an accident or a new construction zone that information immediately gets uh you know uh, uploaded over the air and is propagated to the rest of the fleet so and that's kind of how we think about maps as uh priors in terms <laughs> Another is relevant to another car uh, that is very dynamic. You know, it's not part of kind of you're updating your static prior uh, of the map of the world, but it's more of a dynamic information that could be relevant to the decisions that another car is making in real time. So you can see them exchanging that information and you can build on that. But again, uh, I, I see that as uh, an advantage, but it's, you know, not a requirement. So what about the human in the loop? So uh, when I got a chance to drive with the... Uh, or ride in in a waymo uh, you know there's customer service <laughs> so like there is somebody that's able to uh, dynamically like tune in and uh help you out what uh what role does the human play in that picture that's a in a frictionless way sort of help you out I don't know if they're able to actually control the vehicle. Is that something you could talk to? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, to be clear, we don't do teleoperation. Okay. I'm going to believe in teleoperation for various reasons. That's not what we have in our cars. Uh, we do, as you mentioned, have you know version of you know customer support. Uh, you know we call it life health. In fact, we find it that it's very uh, important for our rider experience, especially if it's your first trip, you've never been in a you know, fully driverless rider only way more vehicle, you get in, there's nobody there. Right? So you can imagine having all kinds of you know, questions in your head, like how this thing works. Uh, so we've put a lot of thought into yeah. kind of guiding our, uh, uh, our is used to service their trip uh, when you get into the car we have an in-car you know screen and audio that kind of guides them and explains uh what to expect uh they also have a button that they can push that will connect connect them to you know a real life human being that they can talk to all right about this whole process so that's one aspect of it uh, there is uh, you know i should mention that there is uh, uh another function that uh humans provide uh, to our cars but it's not teleoperation you can think of it a little bit more like you know fleet assistance kind of like you know traffic control uh that that you have where our cars again they're responsible on their own for making all of the <laughs> the the fully self the, the public version of its fully driverless that's the right term i think service in phoenix is that october 8th that's right yeah okay. it's the introduction of fully driverless rider only vehicles into our you know, public waymo one service okay so that's 
That's amazing. So it's like anybody can get into a Waymo in Phoenix. Uh, that's right. Uh, so we uh, previously had uh, early uh, people in our early rider program uh, taking fully driverless rides in Phoenix, and uh, just uh, this uh, uh, a little while ago, we opened on October eighth. We opened that mode of operation to the public, so yeah, I can you know download the app and you know go on a ride. There is uh, a lot more demand right now uh, for that service, and then we have capacity. Uh, so we're kind of uh, managing that, but that's exactly the way you described it. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So there's more demand than you can you can handle. Like what, uh, what has been the uh, reception so far? Like what, I mean, okay, so, you know, that's, uh, this is a, a product, right? That's a whole nother discussion of like how compelling of a product it is great, but it's also like one of the most kind of transformational technologies of the 21st century. So there, it's also like a tourist attraction. <laughs> like it's fun to, you know, to, to be a part of it. So it'd be interesting to see like, what, what do people say? What do people, uh, what, what have been the feedback so far? You know, still early days, but so far the feedback has been uh, in, incredible, uh, incredibly positive. Uh, they, you know, we asked them for feedback during the ride. We asked them for feedback uh, after the ride uh, as part of their trip. We, you know, we asked them some questions. We asked them to, you know, rate the performance of our driver. Uh, most by far, you know, most of our drivers give us five stars uh, in our app, uh, which is uh, absolutely great to see. And you know, that's and we're they're also giving us feedback on you know things we can improve. Uh, and you know, that's that's one of the main reasons we're doing this is phoenix and you know over the last couple of years and every day today uh we are just learning a tremendous amount of new stuff from our users there's there's no substitute for you know actually doing the real thing actually having a fully driverless product uh, out there in the field with you know users uh that are actually you know paying us money to get from point a to point b so this is a, f a legitimate like there's a paid service that's right and the idea is you use the app to go from point A to point B. And then what, what are the A's? What are the, what's the freedom of the, of the starting and ending places? It's an area of geography where that service is enabled. It's a you know, decent size of geography of territory. It's actually larger than, you know, than size of San Francisco. Uh, and, you know, within that you have, you know, full freedom of you know selecting where you want to go you know of course there's some and you, you on your app uh, you get a map you tell the car where you want to be picked up you know and where you want you know, you know the car to pull over and pick you up and then you tell it where you want to be dropped off all right and of course there's some exclusions right you want to be you know you uh, where in terms of where the car is allowed to pull over right so you know that you can't do but you know besides that uh it's amazing it's comments and the negativity in the comments i'm fascinated by feedback i i believe that most people are good and kind and intelligent and can provide like uh, even in disagreement really fascinating ideas so on a product side it's fascinating to me like how do you get the richest possible user feedback like to improve what's what are the channels that you use to measure because like you're you're no longer that's one of the magical things about autonomous vehicles is it's not it like it's frictionless interaction with the human so like you don't get to you know it's just giving a ride so like how do you get feedback from people to in order to improve Oh uh, yeah, uh, great question. Various mechanisms. Uh, so as part of the normal flow, we ask people for feedback. They, as the car is driving around, you know, we have on the phone and in the car, and we have a touch screen uh, in the car. Uh, you can actually click some buttons and provide uh, real-time feedback on how the car is doing. Uh, and how the car is handling a particular situation, you know, both positive and negative. Uh, so that's one channel. Uh, we have, as we discussed, customer support or life help, where, you know, if a customer wants to, you know, has a question uh, uh, or he has some sort of concern, they can talk to a person uh, in real time. So that that is another mechanism that gives us uh, feedback. Uh, at the end of a trip, 
you know, we also ask them how things went. They give us uh, comments and, you know, a star rating. And, you know, if it's, uh, we also, you know, ask them uh, to uh, uh, explain what, you know, went, went, went well and, you know, what could be improved. And uh, we, we have, uh, our, our writers are providing you know very rich uh, feedback there you know, a lot a large fraction is uh, very passionate and very excited about this technology so we get really good feedback uh we also run uh uxr studies right you know specific uh, that are kind of more you know go more in depth and we will run both kind of uh, lateral and longitudinal studies um where we have you know deeper engagement uh with our customers you know we have our user experience research team tracking over time that's what means about longitudinal it's cool that's that's, right. that's exactly right and you know that's another really valuable in terms of you know latitude and longitude uh, but it happened to be on the other side of a parking lot that had this row of cacti and the poor person had to like walk all around the parking lot to get to where they wanted to be in 110 degree heat so that you know that was a bummer. so then you know we took all take all of these um all of that feedback from our users and uh incorporate it into our system and you know, I- improve it yeah i feel like that's like requires agi to solve the problem of like when you're, which is a very common case, when you're in a big space of some kind, like apartment building, it doesn't matter, it's some, some large space, and then you call the, like a Waymo from there, right? Like so, any, whatever, it doesn't matter, ride share vehicle, and like, where's the pin supposed to drop? I feel like that's, I, you don't think, I think that requires AGI. I'm going to, in order, <laughs> in order to solve. Okay, the alternative, which I think the Google. So you can have maybe something that is not quite as optimal, but is very natural and predictable uh, to the user and kind of works the same way uh, uh, all the time. And that matters. That matters uh, a lot for the user experience. And, and But, you know, to get to the basics, the pretty fundamental property is that the car actually arrives where you told it to right like you can always you know change it see it on the map and you can move it around if you don't like it and but like that property that the car actually shows up reliably on the pin yeah is critical which you know where uh compared to some of the human uh driven yes analogs i think you know you, you can have more predictability it's actually uh the fact uh if if i have a you know i do have a little bit of a detour here uh i think the fact that it's you know your phone and the cars two computers talking to each other uh can lead to some really interesting things we can do in terms of the user interfaces you know both in terms of function uh, like the car actually shows up exactly where you told it uh you want it to be but also some you know really interesting things on the user interface like as the car is driving as you you know call it to, and it's on the way to come and pick you up and of course you get the position of the car and the route on the map uh but and they actually follow that route of course uh but it can also share some really interesting information about what it's doing so uh it... first time i mean other places do that now but just the effortlessness of purchasing making it frictionless it kind of communicates to me like I'm a fan of design, I'm a fan of products, that you can just create a really pleasant experience. That the simplicity of it, the elegance just makes you fall in love with it. So on the, do you think about this kind of stuff? I mean, we've been, that's exactly what we've been talking about. It's like the little details that somehow make you fall in love with the product. Is that, we went from like urban challenge days where, <laughs> where love was not part of the conversation probably <laughs> and to to this point where there's a where there's human beings and you want them to fall in love with the experience um, is that something you're trying to optimize for trying to think about like how do you how do you create an experience that people love uh absolutely i think that's the vision is removing any friction or complexity from getting our users, our writers, to where they want to go. And uh, making that as simple as possible. And then, you know, beyond that, uh, just transportation, making, you know, things and, you know, goods 
get to their destination as seamlessly as possible. I talked about you know, a drag and drop experience where I kind of express your intent and then you know, it just magically happens. And for our riders, that's what we're trying to get to is you download an app and you... you know. It just kind of becomes part of your routine. I, uh, it, it comes down in my mind to uh, safety, predictability of the experience, and um, privacy, I think, uh, aspects of it, right? So uh, our cars, uh, you get the same car, you get very predictable behavior, uh, and that, that is important. And if you're going to use it in your daily life, uh, uh, privacy. I and mean, when you're in a car, you can do other things. You're spending a bunch, just another you know space where you're spending a significant part of your life. Right? So not having to share it with uh, other people who you don't want to share it with, I think, is uh, uh, a very nice property. Uh, maybe you want to you know, take a phone call or you know, do something else in the vehicle. Um, uh, and you know. Uh, safety on the quality of the driving as well as the physical safety of you know not it feels like there is um not all aggression is bad uh now that may be a wrong again 20th century conception of driving maybe it's possible to create a driving experience like if you're in the back busy doing something maybe aggression is not a good thing it's a very different kind of experience perhaps but it feels like in order to navigate this world you need to uh how do i uh phrase this you need to kind of bend the rules a little bit or at least like test the rules i don't know what language politicians use to discuss this but uh <laughs> whatever language they use you like flirt with the rules i don't know but like you uh you sort of uh, have a bit of an aggressive way of driving that asserts your presence in this world, thereby making other vehicles and people respect your presence, and thereby allowing you to sort of navigate through intersections in a timely fashion. I don't know if any of that made sense, but like how does that fit into the experience of driving autonomously? Is that Makes a lot of sense. This is you're hitting on a very important point of you know, uh, a number of behavioral components and um, you know uh, parameters that make your driving feel you know assertive and natural and comfortable and predictable. Um, you know, our cars will follow rules. Right? They will do the safest thing possible in all situations. Let you know, be clear on that. Uh, but if you think of really, really you know, good drivers, just, you know, think about, you know, professional limo drivers, right? They will follow the rules. They're very, very smooth. Uh, and yet they're very efficient. Uh, and, but they're, they're assertive. Uh, they're comfortable for the people in the vehicle. They're predictable for the uh, other people outside the vehicle that they share the environment with. And that, that's the kind of driver that we want to build. And you, just, you know, think if, you know, if uh, maybe there's a sport, analogy there right you know you can do in you know very in many sports the you know, true professionals are very efficient in their movements right so they don't do like a, you know hectic uh, flailing right they're you know smooth and precise right and they get the best results so that's the kind of driver that we want to build in terms of you know aggressiveness yeah you can like you know roll through the stop signs you can do crazy lane changes uh typically doesn't get you to your destination faster typically not the safest or most predictable uh, uh or most comfortable thing to do and uh but there is uh, a way to do both and that 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 that's what we're doing we're trying to build the driver that is Yeah, that means one of the surprising feelings was that it actually, it went fast and it didn't feel. Uh, and I also like the professional limo driver because we often think like, you know, an Uber driver or a bus driver or a taxi. This is the funny thing is, is people think like tra taxi drivers are professionals. <laughs> they i mean it's it's like that that's like saying me i'm a professional walker just because i've been walking all my life 
I think there's an art to it, right? And if you take it seriously as an art form, then the, 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 there's a certain way that mastery looks like. And it's interesting to think about what does mastery look like in driving? And perhaps what we associate with like aggressiveness is unnecessary, like it's not part of the experience of driving. It's like unnecessary fluff that uh, efficiency, you, could, you can be. In life to get anywhere. <laughs> but maybe, maybe it's possible that that's not the case in driving. I have to think about that. But it certainly felt that way on the streets of Phoenix when I was there in, in Waymo. That, 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 that was a very pleasant experience and it wasn't frustrating in that like, come on, move already kind of feeling. It wasn't, it, that wasn't there. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, what, that's what we're going after. I don't think you have to pick one. I think truly good driving it gives you both efficiency, assertiveness, but also comfort and predictability and, you know, safety. Uh, and, you know, it's, that's what fundamental improvements in the core capabilities truly unlock. And you can kind of think of it as, you know, a precision and recall trade-off. You have certain capabilities of your model, and then it's very easy when, you know, you have some curve of precision and recall, you can move things around and can choose your operating point and you're trading off precision versus recall, false positives versus false negatives, right? But then, and, you know, you can tune things on that curve and be kind of more cautious or more aggressive, but then aggressive is bad or, you know, cautious is bad. But true capabilities come from actually moving the whole curve up and, and then you are on kind of on a, on a very different plane of those trade-offs. And that, that's what you know we're trying to do here is to move the whole curve up. Before I forget, let's talk about trucks a little bit. Uh, so I also got a chance to check out some of the Waymo tr uh, trucks. Um, I'm not sure if uh, we want to go too much into that space, but it's a fascinating one. So maybe we can mention at least briefly, you know, Waymo is also now doing autonomous trucking. And uh, how different, like philosophically and technically, is that whole space of problems? It's one of our two big products and, uh, you know, commercial applications of our driver, right? Ride hailing and deliveries. You know, we have Waymo One and Waymo Via, moving people and moving goods. Uh, you know, trucking is an example of uh, moving goods. Uh, we've been uh, working on trucking since 2017. Uh, it is uh, a, a very interesting space. And your question of you know, how different is it? It has this really nice property that the first order challenges, like the science, the hard engineering, uh, whether it's you know hardware or you know onboard software or offboard software, all of the you know systems that you build for you know training your ML models for you know evaluating your time system, like those fundamentals carry over. Like the true challenges of you know, driving, perception, semantic understanding, prediction, decision making, planning, evaluation, uh, the simulator. ML infrastructure, those carry over. Like the data and the application and kind of the, 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 the uh, domains might be different, but the, 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 the most difficult problems, uh, all of that carries over uh, between the domains. So that, that, that's very nice. So that's how we approach it. We're kind of uh, build investing in the core, the technical core, uh, and then there's specialization of, and, uh, uh, of that core technology to different product lines, to different commercial applications. Uh, so on, uh, just to tease it apart a little bit, uh, on trucks, so starting with the hardware, the configuration of the sensors is different, right? They're, they're, they're different you know, physically, you know, geometrically, you know, different vehicles. Uh, so for example, we have two of our main laser uh, on the trucks on, uh, on both sides so that we have, you know, don't have the blind spots. Uh, whereas on the JLR I-PACE, we have, you know, one of it uh, sitting at the very top. But the actual sensors are uh, almost the same or largely uh, the same. So all, all of the investment. Uh, 
fundamental challenges of seeing, understanding the world, whether it's, you know, object detection, classification, you know, tracking, semantic understanding, all that carries over. You know, yes, there's some specialization when you're driving on freeways, uh, you know, range uh, becomes more important. Uh, the domain is a little bit different. But again, the fundamentals carry over you know, very, very nicely. Uh, same, and you guess you get into prediction or decision making, right? The fundamentals of what it takes to predict what other people are going to do, uh, to find the long tail, to improve your system in that long tail of you know, behavior prediction and response that carries over, right? And so on and so on. So, the, I mean, that's pretty exciting. By the way, does uh, Waymo V include using the, the smaller vehicles for transportation of goods? That's an interesting distinction. So I would say there's three interesting modes of operation. So one is moving humans, one is moving goods, and one is like moving nothing, zero occupancy, meaning like you're going to the destination, you, you're, you're empty vehicle. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> the third is the less of a, if that's the entirety of it, it's the less, you know, exciting from the commercial perspective. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I mean, in terms of like, if you think about what's inside a vehicle as it's moving, because it does, you know, some significant fraction of the vehicle's movement has to be empty. I mean, it's kind of fascinating, maybe just on that small point, is is there different control and like policies that are applied for a zero occupancy vehicle? So a vehicle with nothing in it. Or is it just move as if there is a person inside? Well, with with uh, some subtle differences. Uh, as a first order. Uh, <laughs> but you know, gradually is uh, a true answer. So I think the heart of your question is: Can you, know, can you, what, can you ask a better question than I asked? <laughs> you're asking a great answer, question. Answer, answer I, that one. I, 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 I'm, I, you know, just gonna. You know, phrase it in the terms that I want to answer. Yes, sir. Perfect. This is exactly <laughs> so, right. Answer. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> Please. <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, where are we today? And, you know, what happens next? Uh, and what does it take to go beyond Phoenix? And was it, what does it take uh, to get this technology to more places and more people around the world? Right. Um, so, our next big area of focus is exactly that uh larger scale commercialization and just you know scaling up uh if i think about you know the main and you know phoenix gives us that platform and gives us that foundation of upon which we can build and it's there are few really challenging aspects of this whole problem that you have to pull together in order to you know, build the technology. Evaluation and deployment. And the third one is just the you know, product, commercial, and operational excellence. So you can talk... You know, uh, a bit about where we are along, you know, each one of those three dimensions about where we are today and, you know, what has, what will happen next. Um, on, you know, the core technology on, you know, the hardware and software, uh, you know, together uh, comprise of driver, uh, we, you know, night and day, you know, you know, various speeds and various conditions, but the fifth generation is the platform upon which we want to go to massive scale. Uh, we, it, in term, we've really made qualitative improvements in terms of the capability of the system, the simplicity of the architecture, the reliability of the redundancy. Um, uh, it is designed to be manufacturable at very large scale, and you know provides the right unit economics. So that's that's the next big step for us um, on the hardware side. That's that's already there for scale, the version that's, five. That's right. And you, uh, is that a uh, coincidence or should we look into a conspiracy theory that it's the same version as the Pixel phone? <laughs> For 
complete jump, but you know, similar to the uh, that to how we're making that change from the fourth generation hardware to the fifth, we're making similar improvements on the software side to make it more you know robust and more general and allow us to kind of, you know, quickly uh, scale beyond Phoenix. So that that's the first dimension of core technology. The second dimension is evaluation and deployment. You know, how do you uh, measure your system? How do you evaluate it? How do you build the release and deployment process where you know you, with confidence you can you know regularly release new versions of your driver into a fleet? Uh, how do you get good at it so that it is not you know a huge tax on your you know, researchers and engineers? That you know so you can how, how do you build all of these you know processes, the frameworks, the simulation, the evaluation, the data science, the validation, so that, you know, people can focus on improving the system and kind of the releases uh, just go out the door and get deployed across the fleet. Uh, so we've gotten really good at that uh, in uh, Phoenix. That's been a tremendously difficult problem, uh, but that's what we have uh, in Phoenix right now that gives us that foundation. And now we're working on kind of incorporating all the lessons that we've learned uh, to make it more efficient, to go to new places, you know, and scale up and just kind of, you know, stamp things out. Uh, so that's that second dimension of evaluation and deployment. And the third dimension is uh, product, commercial and operational excellence, right? And again, Phoenix there uh, is providing uh, an incredibly valuable platform. You know, that's why we're doing things end to end uh, in Phoenix. We're learning as, you know, we discussed uh, a little earlier today, tremendous amount of really valuable lessons from our users getting really incredible feedback. Uh, and uh, we'll continue to iterate on that and incorporate all those uh, those lessons into making our product, you know, uh, even better and more convenient for our users. So you, you're converting this whole process of Phoenix in Phoenix into uh, something that could be copy and pasted elsewhere. So like, uh, perhaps you didn't think of it that way when you were doing the experimentation Phoenix, but so how long did, you basically, I mean, you can correct me, but you've, I mean, it's still early days, but you've taken the full journey in Phoenix, right? As you were saying, uh, of like what it takes to basically automate. I mean, it's not the entirety of Phoenix, right? But I imagine it, it can encompass the entirety of Phoenix at some some uh, near-term date, but that's not even... All over the place. Uh, but Phoenix, what you know, we did in Phoenix, and we very intentionally... I don't know. There's a warmth to uh, to Austin that I love, and since Waymo does have a little bit of a history there, is that a possibility? <laughs> is this your version of asking the question of like, you know, Dimitri? I know you can't share your commercial and deployment roadmap, yeah, yeah, but, but I'm thinking about moving to you know, San Francisco, <laughs> of Austin. Like, you know, blink twice if you think I should move to. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. You got me. But we, you know, we've been <laughs> testing in all over the place. I think we've been testing in more than you know, 25 cities. Uh, we drive in San Francisco. We drive in you know Michigan for snow. Uh, we, we are doing a significant amount of testing in the Bay Area, including San Francisco. Now, which right? is not like, because we're talking about the very different thing, which is like a full-on large geographic area public service. Uh, you, you can't share. Any, okay. Thank you. <sighs> what about Moscow? Is that when is that happening? Take on uh, Yandex. I'm not paying attention to those. Is there other friction that you've encountered, except sort of technological friction of solving this very difficult problem? Is there other stuff that you have to overcome? when when uh, deploying a public service in a city that's interesting it's, it's very important so we we put significant effort in uh creating those partnerships and you know those relationships with governments at all levels you know local governments municipalities you know state level federal level uh we've been engaged in very deep conversations from the earliest days of our you know uh, projects uh whenever uh, at all of these levels you know whenever we go uh, to 
test uh, or you know operate in a new area you know we always lead with you know, with a conversation uh, with the local officials um, and but the result of that that investment is that no it's not challenges we have to overcome it is, but it is a very important that we you know, continue to have this conversation oh yeah i love politicians too okay uh so mr elon musk said that uh lidar is a crutch what are your thoughts <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't characterize it exactly that way. Uh, I know. I think light, LiDAR is uh, very important. Uh, it is a key sensor uh, that you know we use just like other modalities. Right? And as we discussed, uh, our cars use cameras, uh, LiDARs, and radars. Um, they are all very important. They are at the kind of the physical level. They are very different. They have very different, you know, physical characteristics. Um, cameras are passive, lidars and radars are active. They use different wavelengths, uh, so that means they complement each other uh, and very nicely. And and, and they you know, together combined, they can be used to build a much uh, safer and much more capable system. So you know, to me, it's more of a question. You know, why the heck would you handicap yourself and not use one or more of those sensing modalities when they, you know, uh, undoubtedly just make your system uh, more capable and safer? Um, now, it, you know, what might make sense for one product uh, or one business might not make sense for another one. So if you're you know, talking about driver assist technologies, you make certain design decisions and you make certain trade-offs and you make different ones. If you are you know, building a driver uh, that you uh, deploy in fully driverless uh, vehicles. Uh, and, you know, and LiDAR specifically, when this question comes up, I, uh, you know, typically the criticisms uh, that I hear uh, or you know, the uh, counterpoints that cost and aesthetics. And like I, I don't find either of those uh, honestly very compelling. So on the cost side, there's nothing fundamentally prohibitive about you know the cost of lighters. You know, radars used to be very expensive uh, before people started. You know, uh, before people made certain advances in technology and you know, started to, to, to manufacture them uh, at massive scale and deploy them in vehicles. Right? Uh, so, you know, similar with lighters. And this is where the lighters that we have on our cars, especially the fifth generation, uh, you know, we've been able to make some pretty qualitative discontinuous jumps in terms of the fundamental technology that allow us to you know, manufacture those things at very uh, significant scale and at a fraction of the cost of you know, both our previous generation as well as a you know, fraction of the cost of you know, what might be available on the market you know, off the shelf right now. And you know, that improvement will continue. So I, I, I think you know, cost is uh, not a, a real issue. Uh, second one is uh, you know, uh, aesthetics. Uh, you know, I don't think that's, you know, a real issue either. Uh, uh, Beauty is an eye of the beholder. Yeah. You can, make uh, this, you can make LiDAR sexy again. I think you're exactly right. I think it is sexy. Like, honestly, I think form yeah, I always all thought, function. <laughs> well, and, okay. You know, I was actually, somebody brought this up to me. Um, I mean, all forms of LiDAR, even, uh, even like the ones that are like big, you can make look... I mean, uh, it can make it look beautiful. Like, uh, there's no sense in which you can't integrate it into design. Like, uh, there's all kinds of awesome designs. I don't think small and humble is is beautiful. It could be like, you know, brutalism, or like it could be uh, like harsh corners. I mean, like I said, like hot rods. Like, I don't like. I don't. Of the hardware that we put on our vehicles, you know, I will not comment on, on the your, Porsche. Okay. you know, Porsche monologue. <laughs> okay, all right. So, but aesthetics, fine. But there's an underlying like philosophical question behind the kind of lighter question is like how much of the problem can be solved with uh, computer vision with uh, machine learning? So, I think without sort of disagreements and so on it's nice to put 
uh, it on the spectrum because Waymo is doing a lot of machine learning as well. It's interesting to think how much of driving, if we look at five years, 10 years, 50 years down the road, would can be learned in an almost more and more and more end-to-end -end way. If we look at what Tesla is doing with uh, as a machine learning problem, they're doing a multitask learning thing where it's just they break up driving into a bunch of learning tasks and they have one single neural network and they're just collecting huge amounts of data that's training that. I've recently hung out with George Hotz. I don't know if you know George. <laughs> uh, I, I love him so much. <laughs> he's just an entertaining human being. We were off mic talking about Hunter S. Thompson. He's he's the Hunter S. Thompson of autonomous driving. Okay, so he, I, I didn't realize this with Kama AI, but they're like really trying to do end to end. They're the machine, the mach like looking at the machine learning problem, they're, uh, really not doing multitask learning, but it's uh, it's it's computing the drivable area as a machine learning task and hoping that like l down the line, this level two system that's driver assistance will eventually lead to uh, allowing you to have a fully autonomous vehicle. Okay, there's an underlying deep philosophical question there, technical question of, how much of driving can be learned. So LiDAR is an effective tool today uh, for actually deploying a successful service in Phoenix, right? That's safe, that's reliable, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the the question, and I'm not saying you can't do machine learning on LiDAR, but the, the, the question is that like how much of driving can be learned eventually? Can we do fully autonomous that's learned? Yeah. Uh, you know, learning is all over the place and uh, plays a key role in every part of our system. I, I, as you said, I would, uh, you know, decouple the sensing modalities from the, you know, ML and the software parts of it. Uh, LiDAR, radar, cameras, like it's all machine learning. Uh, all of the object detection classification, of course, like well, that, that's what you know, these uh, modern deep nets and ground nets are very good at. You feed them raw data, massive amounts of raw data. Um, and you know, then, uh, that's actually what our custom build lighters and radars are really good at. And radars, they don't just give you point estimates of you know, objects in space, they give you raw, like. <laughs> into some you know, fairly complex design choices where on one hand you want modularity and decompos decompositability, decompositability. Mm -hmm. You're giving up on the generality of a solution or you're unable to properly propagate signal, you know, reach signal forward and losses and, you know, uh, back, back so you can, you know, optimize the whole system jointly. Uh, so I would decouple, and I guess what you're seeing in terms of the fusion of the sensing data from different modalities, as well as kind of fusion at in the temporal level, going more from, you know, frame by frame, uh, where, you know, you would have one net that would do frame by frame detection and camera, and then, you know, something that does frame by frame and lighter and then radar, and then you fuse it, at, you know, in a weaker engineered way later, like the field over the last, you know, decade has been evolving in more kind of joint fusion, more end to end models that are, you know, solving some of these tasks, you know, jointly, and there's tremendous power in that. And you know that that's that's that that's the progression that you kind of our you know, uh, our stack has been on as well. Now it's your you know the, the, so I would decouple the you know, sensing and how that information is fused from the role of ML in the entire stack. And you know I guess it's uh, I there's trade-offs and uh, you know modularity and how do you inject uh, inductive bias into your system? All right, this is uh, there's tremendous power in being able to do that. So, you know, we have, there's no part of our system that is not heavily, uh, that does not heavily, you know, leverage, you know, data-driven development or, you know, state-of-the-art ML. But there's mapping, there's a simulator, or there's perception, you know, object level, you know, perception, whether it's semantic understanding, prediction, decision-making, you know, so forth and so on. Um, it's and you know, of course object detection and classification, like you know, finding pedestrians and cars and cyclists and you know cones and signs and vegetation and being very good at estimating like, kind of detection classification and state estimation. There's just stable stakes. 
Like, like that's step zero of this whole stack. You can be incredibly good at that, whether you use cameras or light as a radar, but that's just, you know, that's stable stakes. That's just step zero. Beyond that, you get into the really interesting challenges of semantic understanding at the perception level. You get into scene level reasoning. You get into very deep problems uh, that have to do with prediction and joint prediction and interaction, total interaction between all of the actors in the environment, pedestrians, cyclists, other cars, and you get into decision-making. Right. So how do you build all those systems? So uh, we leverage ML very heavily in all of these components. I do believe that the best results uh, you achieve by kind of using a hybrid approach and having different types of ML, uh, having uh, different models with different degrees of inductive bias that you can have, uh, and combining kind of model, you know, free approaches with some, you know, model-based approaches and some uh, uh, rule-based, uh, physics-based uh, systems. So, you know, one example I can give you is traffic lights. Uh, the, there's problem of the detection of traffic light state, and obviously that's a great problem for, you know, computer vision. Confidence are, you know, that's their bread and butter, right? Uh, that's how you build that. But then the interpretation of you know uh, of a traffic light that you, you don't need to learn that right you, you you read you don't need to build some you know complex ml model that you know infers with some you know precision and recall that red means stop like it was a it's a very clear engineered signal with very clear semantics yeah. right so you want to induce that bias like how you induce that bias and that whether you know it's a constraint or a cost you know function in your stack but like it is important to be able to inject that like clear semantic signal into your stack and you know that's what we do um and but then the question of like and, and that's when you apply it to yourself when you are making decisions whether you want to stop for a red light you know or not uh it but if you think about how other people treat traffic lights we're back to the ml version of that mm -hmm. because like, you know they're supposed to stop for a red light but that doesn't mean they will so then you're back in the like very uh heavy uh ml domain where you're picking up on like very subtle cues about you know that have to do with the behavior of objects and pedestrians cyclists cars and <laughs> uh work that's happening in um kind of more uh, you know, and, and bigger models and, you know, models that, uh, have more structure, uh, to them, uh, you know, not just, you know, large, uh, bitmaps and reason about temporal sequences and, uh, some of the interesting breakthroughs that you've, you know, we've seen in language models, right? You know, transformers, you know, you know, GPT, you know, three and friends, uh, there's some really interesting applications of some of the core breakthroughs to those problems of, you know, behavior prediction, as well as, you know, decision-making and planning, right? You can think about it, kind of the, the behavior, uh, how, you know, the path, the trajectories, the, the, how people drive, uh, they have kind of a share, a lot of the fundamental structure, you know, this problem, there's, you know, sequential, you know, nature, there's a lot of structure uh, in this representation. There is a strong locality, kind of like in sentences, you know, words that follow each other, they're strongly connected, but there is also kind of larger context that doesn't have that locality. And you also see that in driving, right? What, you know, is happening in the scene as a whole has very strong implications on, uh, you know, the kind of the next step in that sequence where the, whether you're you know, predicting what other people are going to do, whether you're making your own decisions, or whether in the simulator you're building generative models of you know humans walking, cyclists riding, and other cars driving. Oh, that's that's all really fascinating. Like how it's fascinating to think that uh, transformer models and all the all the breakthroughs in language and NLP that might be applicable to like driving at the higher level at the behavior level. That's kind of fascinating. Um, let me ask about pesky little creatures called pedestrians and cyclists. Uh, they seem so humans are a problem. If we can get rid of them, I would. Uh, but unfortunately, they're all sort of a source of joy and love and beauty. So let's keep them around. They're also our customers. Oh, for your perspective, yes, yes, for sure. Uh, <laughs> they're source of money. Very good. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't even know where I was going. Oh, yes. But so you don't want to run them over? <laughs> from that perspective. Uh, 
I mean, I don't know. I'm I'm joking a lot, but the, I think in seriousness, like you know, pedestrians are complicated. Um, uh, computer vision problem, a co complicated behavioral problem. Is there something interesting you could say about what, you, what you've learned from a machine learning perspective, from also an autonomous vehicle and a product perspective about just interacting with the humans in this world? Yeah, just, you know, to state on record, we care deeply about the safety of pedestrians, you know, even the ones that don't have Twitter accounts. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, <laughs> all right, uh, all right but, cool. You know, uh, Not uh, me. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, yes, I, I'm glad I'm glad somebody does. Okay. Uh, but, you know, in all, uh, in all seriousness, uh, safety of uh, vulnerable road users, uh, you know, pedestrians or cyclists, is one of our highest priorities. Uh, we do a tremendous amount of testing uh, and validation and put a very significant emphasis on you know the capabilities of our systems that have to do with safety around those unprotected so they will drive through school zones right so uh, kids uh, are kind of this the very special class of those vulnerable user road users right and you want to be you know super super safe uh, uh, and super super cautious around those so we take it very 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 seriously um and you know what does it take uh, to uh, around in front of you? You know the the, the bike goes flying the other uh, direction. Like the two objects that used to be one are now you know uh, are splitting apart, and the car has to like detect all of that. Uh, and, like milliseconds matter, and it doesn't. You know it's not good enough to just brake. You have to like steer and brake, and there's traffic around you. So like it all has to come together and it was really great uh to see in this case and other cases like that uh that we're actually seeing in the wild that our system is you know performing exactly the way uh that we would have liked and is able to you know avoid uh collisions like this it's such an exciting space for robotics like in the in that split second to make decisions of life and death i don't know the stakes are high in a sense but it's also beautiful that um I'm, so for somebody who loves artificial intelligence, the possibility that an AI system might be able to save a human life, uh, that's kind of exciting uh, as, a, as a problem, like to wake up. It gets, it's terrifying probably from an for an engineer to wake up and to think about, but it's also exciting because it's like, it's, it's in your hands. Let me try to ask a question that's often brought up about autonomous vehicles. And uh, it might be fun to see if you have anything, anything interesting to say, which is about the trolley problem. Of the difficult ethical decisions that uh, we humans have before us in this complicated world. Uh, so the, specifically is the choice between if you are forced to choose uh, to kill a group x of people versus a group y of people like one person if you didn't if you did nothing you would kill one person but if you, you would kill five people and if you decide to swerve out of the way you would only kill one person do you do nothing or you choose to do something and you can construct all kinds of sort of ethical experiments of this kind that uh, I, I think at least on a positive note inspire you to think about like introspect what are the the physics of our morality and there's usually not good answers there uh, i think it people love it because it's just an exciting thing to think about i think people who build autonomous vehicles usually roll their eyes because uh this is not this one as constructed this like literally never comes up in reality you never have to choose between killing <laughs> one or like one of two groups of people. But I wonder if you can speak to, is there some something interesting to you as an engineer of autonomous vehicles that's within the trolley problem? Or maybe more generally, are there difficult ethical decisions that you find that uh, algorithm must make? On the specific version of the trolley problem, which one would you do if you're driving? The question itself is a profound question because we humans ourselves yeah. cannot answer it, and that's yeah. the very point. 
Uh, I guess, I'll kill uh, both. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, humans. Uh, I think you're exactly right in that. You know, humans are not particularly good. I think they kind of phrased as a, like, what would a computer do? You know, this. If you go back to that analogy of you know precision and recall, like, okay, you can make a tr you know very hard trade off of, you know, I, but like neither answer is really good. But what you know, instead you focus on is kind of moving. technical that had a big impact on you as an engineer or as a human being you know everything from science fiction to a favorite textbook is there three books that stand out that you can think of uh three books so i would uh you know that impacted me um i would say uh uh, uh and this one is you, you probably know it well, um, but and not generally well known. I, I think in the U.S. or kind of internationally, the Master and Margarita. Uh, it's uh, uh, one of actually my favorite uh, books. Um, it is you know by a Russian. It's a novel by Russian author uh, Mikhail Bulgakov, and it's just it's it's a great book. You know, it's one of those books that you can like reread your entire life and it's it's very accessible <laughs> you can read it meaning. as a kid and like it's yeah. it you know it's a, the, the plot is interesting it's you know the the devil you know visiting the soviet union and you know but it it, it like you read it reread it uh at different stages of your life and you just, you, know, it, you enjoy it for different very different reasons and you keep finding like deeper and deeper meaning uh and you know it kind of affected you know had a definitely had a like imprint on me you know, mostly from the you know, probably kind of the cultural stylistic uh, aspect. Like it makes you th one of those books that, you know, is, uh, is good and makes you think, but also has like this really, you know, silly, quirky, dark sense of, you know, humor. Yeah, it uh, captures so. the Russian soul That's more cool. than many, perhaps many other books. On that like slight note, just out of curiosity, one of the saddest things is I've read that book in English. Uh, did, did you by chance read it in English or in Russian? Uh, in Russian, only in Russian, uh, and I, actually, that, that that is a question I had uh, uh, kind of posed to myself every once in a while. Like, I wonder how well it translates, uh, if it translates at all. And there's the language aspect of it, and then there's the cultural aspect. So, I and actually, I'm not sure if you know either of those uh, would so, you know, work well in English. Now, I forget their names, but so when the COVID lifts a little bit, I'm traveling to Paris. Uh, for for several reasons, one is just I've never been to Paris. I want to go to Paris, but there's a the most famous translators of uh, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, of most of Russian literature, live there. There's a couple; they're famous, uh, a man and a woman. And I'm gonna sort of have a series of conversations with them. And in preparation for that, I'm starting to read Dostoevsky in Russian. So I'm really embarrassed to say that I've read this everything I've read of Russian literature of like serious depth has been in English, even though I, I can also read, I mean, obviously in Russian, but for some reason it seemed uh, uh, in the optimization of life, it seemed the improper decision to do, to read in Russian. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah. like I don't need to, opt I need to think in English, not in Russian. But now I'm changing my mind on that. And so the question of how well it translates is a really fundamental one, like it, even with Dostoevsky. So from what I understand, Dostoevsky translates easier. Uh, uh, others don't as much. Obviously the poetry doesn't translate as well. I'm also the the music, a uh, big fan of Vladimir Vosotsky. He doesn't obviously translate well. People have tried. But Master Margaret, I, I don't know. I don't know about that one. Uh, I just know it in English, and it was fun, fun as hell in English. So, uh, so, but it's a curious question, and I want to study it rigorously from both a machine learning aspect and also because I want to do a couple of interviews in Russia that um, I'm still unsure of how to properly conduct an interview across a language barrier? It's a fascinating question that ultimately communicates to an American audience. There's a few. In an English speaking world, don't get to appreciate some like the depth of the culture because it's lost in translation. And I feel like. This is the Lex Free Podcast.